Let me know when we're going. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you very much for joining us for this, which is the second session of an intergenerational dialogue that we're having uh, on the issues of hope, or finding hope in the climate peace and disarmament nexus. Uh, this is uh, organized by Citizens for Global Solutions, Parliamentarians for Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Disarmament, Youth Fusion, and World Federalist Movement Institute for Global Policy. And my name is Alan Ware. Uh, I am got positions with a couple of those organizations. Uh, I'm the program director for the World Federalist Movement Institute for Global Policy. Uh, and I'm also the global coordinator of parliamentarians for nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament. Uh, as I mentioned, this is the second session of two sessions which we, we've been having on this topic. Uh, this session is timed uh, primarily for people in the Asia Pacific region, uh, but of course it's open for people anywhere in the world. So uh, early risers in Europe or uh, in other parts of the world are also able uh, to join and we welcome everybody here. Uh, what we'll be uh, doing today uh, in terms of ex exploring this issue is to have uh, three, we call them, I guess, mini <laughs> sessions or mini panels uh, with um, a more seasoned uh, expert on these issues, uh, paired off with a young and upcoming expert. Um, so a, a young person paired with a young at heart um, and have a, a dialogue on some of the uh, sub-issues within this process. Uh, so what we are looking at is in particular, the, the potential of common security and global governance in order to foster cooperation to more effectively address the climate, peace and disarmed issues. So moving beyond just policy proposals and, uh, and campaigns uh, on those specific issues, uh, how we can uh, build in global governance, how we can manage these issues better uh, cooperatively across the planet, um, and in particularly in an intergenerational approach, uh, bringing together youthful energy and innovation uh, with the seasoned expertise and experience. Uh, there will be, of course, an uh, opportunity for uh, participants uh, to engage uh, in this event uh, and uh, in, a, in a number of ways. Uh, the chat box is enabled, uh, so you can share uh, information uh, in the chat box. Uh, and we, we encourage you to introduce yourself and let us know where you're from. Uh, and then also uh, for questions and answers uh, to the panelists, uh, we encourage you to use the question and answer uh, box, which is down the bottom of your screen, and that will help when we get to the question and answer phase um, of these proceedings. Um, I have a couple of people who are helping uh, in, uh, in the background, uh, Holly, Vanessa and Vanda, uh, and they'll be putting in some links uh, to some of the uh, documents or reports or websites or campaigns uh, that the speaker is going to be talking about. Uh, so that information will be popping up also in the chat box. So I think that's about enough introduction from me. And then we'll look forward now to uh, the first pair of speakers uh, that we're going to be uh, introducing. So we have six speakers altogether uh, in two pairs. So the first ones are uh, Nishan Gunasekara uh, and Nicole Ponce. Uh, Nishan uh, is from originally from Sri Lanka, uh, now living in Sweden, uh, is a visiting fellow uh, at the Roald Wallenberg Institute of Human Rights and Humanitarian Law, a director of the International Association of Lawyers Against Nuclear Arms, co-chair of the Earth Trusteeship Working Group, uh, and lead counsel for peace, justice, and strong institutions at the Center for International Sustainable Development. Um, and it's also was a student and now is taking forward the legacy of uh, Justice Wiramatri, who is at one stage a vice president of the International Court of Justice. Uh, Nishan, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and I'll, no, I'll now introduce uh, the person who's gonna be joining you in this first uh, panel, uh, sub panel, um, and that's Nicole Ponce. Uh, who's originally from Philippines, uh, I believe is now working uh, in the Normandy, with the Normandy Chair for Peace, uh, was a, a co-founder and of the and coordinator of I Am Climate Justice Movement, 
and is the Asia Front Coordinator for World's Youth for Climate Justice. Welcome, Nicole, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, so both of you, um, I'm going to kick off with, the, with a, like an opening question uh, for you to, to both address. Uh, both of you are involved in, uh, in the law and use of the law, application of law uh, with regards to these issues, uh, climate, peace and disarmament. So I want to ask sort of a question about that, because uh, while legal outcomes and institutions, both domestically and internationally, are often seen as a, as a product of political negotiations, something to follow, I think what you're coming and both of you are, are demonstrating is that law itself contributes to policy, contributes to the development um, of uh, policy outcomes on these, particularly on these issues, climate uh, and uh, moving towards net zero carbon economies and peace and nuclear disarmament. Uh, so, what legal frameworks can provide both a non-discriminatory body of obligations, which is applicable to all, a range of mechanisms for conflict resolution and to support diplomacy, uh, and to elevate uh, and shape political will. So my first question of both of you, and I'll start with Nishan, is what are some of the legal developments and processes uh, that can enhance the abolition of nuclear weapons? And you can also talk about climate change if you wish. wish. Uh, what are some of the key legal developments and processes? Uh, so Nishan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alan, and I want to come. Assalamu alaikum and good morning from Lund. Uh, great pleasure to be here. Uh, and thank you for the invitation. Also a pleasure to share the dice with Tiko and to and look forward to listening to your point. Alan, very interesting question. Um, I think that you have selected a very timely topic, hope for these processes. And I think uh, my response will uh, majority of the time trying to respond to within finding hope with the legal framework. We are in 2023, and uh, I will begin with an anniversary which was celebrated last Monday, which is the 17th of July, 2023. It's been 25 years since the Rome Statute established in the International Criminal Court uh, was signed back in 1998. So that was a uh, quarter of a century ago. And uh, that sets out both the international criminal law framework, but also a very important institution that allows not only member states of the United Nations, but other entities and entities to also uh, take up instances of individual criminal responsibility. Now I recall uh, meeting one of the forefathers of uh, the this body of uh, law, but also the institutionalizing of international criminal law, late Arthur Robinson, former president of Trinidad and Tobago. And uh, during one of the kind of meetings that we were looking at, crimes against future generations uh, back in 2007, eight, he had this to say that all meetings between humans lead to constructive dialogue. And this constructive dialogue is the only way for us to reach a higher consciousness. So the body of international criminal law and the work of the Rome Statute is absolutely key. And within that, uh, some of uh, those who are going to be speaking later are also involved in a campaign called the Ecocide Campaign, which criminalizes long-term impact on the environment. Now this, body of law and development uh, is absolutely key to looking at uh, the devastating impact that both nuclear weapons, but also climate change has not only on the current generation, but many, many generations to come. Uh, and here, obviously, I will fail in my duty if I do not mention the wonderful vision that Judge Christopher Wienermanthri left in his jurisprudence in the International Court of Justice again over a quarter of a century ago, when he opined in the celebrated dissenting opinion of the International Court of Justice, where he said that nuclear weapons are illegal under all circumstances within international law. And he went into great detail looking at customary religious as well as other indigenous 
principles and legal systems to support his arguments, saying that international law should necessarily outlaw all these weapons of mass destruction. And that gave rise to a number of organizations and processes. Uh, and uh, one key point I would like to highlight from the judgment is that, that each and every time that un unfortunately we come up with you know, weapons of mass destruction, there should not be a specific treaty outlawing that because already in the existing body of law and jurisprudence, we have enough and more uh, uh, to talk about banning such weapons. I mean, we go back to the 1833 convention banning the dumb, dumb bullet. We banned the biological weapons, chemical weapons, and, and layers of weapons and so forth. But here we are in 2023, still not very sure whether nuclear weapons are illegal. But I think as lawyers and those involved in the legal profession has a duty to look deeper into the customary principles of law as set out uh, in the statutes and then, in, sorry, as set out and then interpret the conventions as statutes in line with what is best for both current and future generations. And I will end by kind of uh, initially some thoughts on some of the other developments. International humanitarian law, which is an older body of law going back to the Geneva Conventions in 1860s, uh, talks about laws of armed conflict, clearly depict the damage that can be done uh, in the long term, and, and specifically talking about damage to environment, another framework of law that discusses hope for the destruction of nuclear weapons, as well as what happens through climate impact. And we have the development of international human rights law and to kind of look back at you know, 75 years of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the 30 years since the Vienna Plan of Action gives us enough and more uh, to kind of interpret uh, the interests of current and future generations are not met with the current policies of uh, furthering nuclear weapons. And we need to necessarily look at disarmament and ways of peace. And International environment law, where Judge Viramantri championed, also brings out principles such as trusteeship and intergenerational equity. And these are found in numerous international environment law treaties, over 35 to count. And of recent times, we've, of course, given strength to common heritage of humankind and taken seriously the note of responsibilities both within member states, but more importantly, responsibilities beyond the boundaries of nation states. And I think that is a key development that we need to necessarily take uh, cognizance of as we interpret hope uh, for uh, the planet as well as all other species alongside humans. So I will limit my initial remarks and perhaps come back later. Thank you, Alan, over. Thank you very much, Nish. And this is a very good sort of uh, introduction and overview. I'm going to circle back to you later uh, with regards to uh, the political power and weight and influence um, of this law that you've been mentioning, the, the various aspects of international law, particularly customary international law. Uh, but first, I'm going to go to, to Nicole uh, to ask the same question. Legal developments, what are some of the key legal developments and processes uh, that can enhance the achievement of global net zero carbon emissions? Uh, I think in particular, the, the current case in the International Court of Justice on climate change would be something be really good to introduce into the discussion here. Uh, Nicole, and the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Alan. Um, thank you, Nishan. I think Nishan pretty much sums up sum that up very well. So just to uh, build on that a little, yeah, there is no general international law instrument which defines the core principles of intergenerational equity and its legal status is still controversial. Um, the status quo is obviously quite problematic because there has been evidence and quite overwhelming of the application of the principle in international and domestic proceedings. It is well known and we're guided by the ICJ and its advisory opinion on the legality of the threat of use of nuclear weapons, which has referred to the need to protect generations unborn, and also the Gopchetko-Nudge-Mora case, where in Hungary invoked the concept of preserving species for future generations as a moral obligation and the concept of trusteeship, trusteeship over the Earth's resources. So in the judicial front, for example, there has been also a recent case of uh, court cases brought 
uh, on by on behalf of minor plaintiffs and future generations is the case filed by 16 children against five countries before the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child in the case lodged by groups of Portuguese youth at the European Court of Human Rights against 33 states. So I think these are also very key uh, legal developments. And of course, as I, uh, Alan has mentioned, the upcoming advisory opinions, not just at the International Court of Justice, but the ones at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights and ITLUS as well. So um, I think I would just like to highlight the ones at the advisory opinion with the International Court of Justice, because uh, that's one that's uh, the one I'm personally uh, working on. And um, I'm very happy with the development. Uh, the Vanuatu's prime minister has uh, often said that the campaign, this campaign, um, the ICJ AO at the International Court of Justice is a campaign to build uh, ambition and not division. And it's also a campaign to uplift the goals of the Paris Agreement. So um, a central um, opinion, I mean, an opinion from the court clearly sit, setting out legal obligation owed to the world's most climate vulnerable countries and their present and future citizen will greatly assist in further securing frameworks of justice and equity within the UNFCC and Paris Agreement um, processes. So it's known that the establishment of legally binding international treaties and agreements such as the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change play a very crucial role in setting clear uh, objectives and obligations for states to work towards nuclear disarmament and carbon emissions reduction. So I'm happy to take on or discuss this further later on in the Q&A or Alan, if you have any further questions. Thank you very much, Nicole. I'm going to circle back to, to Nesha now just to ask about um, if you can comment on the influence or the political weight of international judicial processes, such as decisions from the International Court of Justice, um, do they have an influence on, on state behaviour? Or is it because the acceptance of jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice is on a voluntary basis, it's really up to the states themselves whether or not they follow the, the decisions, the advisory opinions of the International Court of Justice. And if they are influential, are there any initiatives to help to build the jurisdiction of the court to get more countries uh, to accept its uh, jurisdiction on a compulsory basis? Nishan. Thank you, Alan. I think uh, that's a, a loaded question, but I think it has various elements into it. Um, the first answer, I think, uh, is that we should not consider treaties and documents in isolation, but as a whole. I'm specifically referring to, for example, interpreting international human rights law and norms within the Charter of the United Nations, which, as you know, uh, the statute of the International Court of Justice is very much part of it. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and therefore, uh, institutions set up for the wide administration. I think, uh, you know, Nicole mentioned the International Court of Justice, but at the regional level, there's the European Court of uh, Human Rights, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. These are all key processes that, you know, the, the, the what we could call the conference of the willing, both the political has given rise to. And I think, uh, I agree with Nicole that these uh, the cases before such courts are, are key um, processes that we need to take a, uh, seriously a look at because obviously these are also member states that have been challenged uh, and, and within that there is a lot of hope for bringing about uh, the appreciation of uh, applic application of not only the processes leading to such courts but interpreting and applying the judgments of such courts. The ICJ specifically has been a, a key instrument over the years. Uh, and uh, I mean, we were referring to the Nuclear Weapons Advisory Opinion, which is possibly the most significant case ever to go before the court in the last century. And possibly uh, the Climate Change Advisory Opinion will be the most important case to go before the International Court of Justice this century. And between the two, there's been quarter of a century of process. And if you really dig deep, uh, not only to the application of the judgments, but application of the principles and processes that lead to these things and the stories that come out from uh, application of international law, 
has been very significant in moving the consciousness uh, of the wider political bodies and instruments on the planet. And I think we need to take serious notice of that. And, and uh, on the compulsory jurisdiction of uh, uh, the uh, International Court of Justice, I think this is absolutely necessary as we move towards the 100th anniversary of the UN Charter and other instruments surrounding it in 2048. Uh, 2045, 2048, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, understand, you know, Alan, yourself and a few of us as involved in bringing out a campaign to get uh, further countries to sign on. And whilst this campaign is important, it is also important to look at uh, the institutional framework. Now, Nicole mentioned uh, the young people challenge in the European Court of Human Rights. And there are two other cases before the European Court of Human Rights. For example, there's a group of pensioners who you know, jokingly call themselves grannies for climate change, uh, also taking on the European Court of Human Rights. And also there is an individual, a mayor, who's challenging a state before the European Court of Human Rights. And I think this is an interesting development. I mean, you know, we are way beyond the time that only member states can be bring cases before uh, these tribunals. And the Inter-American Court of Human Rights has, you know, uh, within its law for civil society make representation. And the ICJAO on climate change for the last two months, we've had the Commission of Small Island States being invited to submit their, you know, uh, 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 kind of uh, take on the advisory opinion. And so as the IUCN has been invited. And I think we need to unpack this uh, kind of developments uh, in, in, in light of uh, the political realities of the day. Yes, there is a conflict going on and we are closer to a nuclear bomb going on, going off uh, like never before, uh, you know, and there's also, uh, unfortunately, lessons not well learned from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, you know, uh, <clears throat> 78 years ago, as, uh, as, as, uh, as we are unfortunately learning of what's going on in Fukushima and the possibility of all that radioactive waste being thrown into the Pacific Ocean, which will affect the whole planet. But there is a body of law. It is not only up to South Korea or China or the Pacific Island states, who obviously time and time again bring about change. It is up to all of us, all lawyers, and we're involved in processes to put pressure and to bring about change. The legal body is there. Uh, and I think uh, it's no longer that we can say silent that, you know, what affects one part of the world doesn't affect the other part of the world. It's not true. It's just one small blue marble that we are on. And I think the institutions that we set up uh, to, uh, you know, be guardians of international law are doing extremely well. It's just that the political realities of the day, the media is giving a different picture. I think therefore we need a concerted effort to bring campaigns around this. And you know, Nicole and your team, you know, incredible work. You know, 133 member states consensus resolution before the United Nations General Assembly, a key institution, which I say obviously representing the political will on the planet at the moment. And you guys were able to move that. So that is incredibly inspirational for in, in, you know, international law. But we should not stop there. I think we need to believe in our processes and build the processes toward compulsory jurisdiction of the ICJ for other member states, recognizing that member states are also trustees of the earth. Thank you very much, Nesha. And you've mentioned in a range of ways how, how international law uh, is not just for lawyers or states. Uh, but civil society can be engaged at different levels. You mentioned mayor involvement, uh, the, the case that the, currently in the International Court of Justice on Climate Change came from youth, came from the, from the Pacific Island students fighting climate change and World Youth for Climate Justice. So I'm going to circle back now to Nicole, uh, specifically on this case, the ICJ case on climate change. Um, <clears throat> It's not just about states putting in submissions. This is, they're in the submissions process at the moment. And in the chat, I put the video message from the Vanuatu Attorney General encouraging governments to make submissions, but also encouraging international organizations. So can you say a little bit more, Nicole, about the participation of youth, about impacted communities, um, international organizations in the, the current case on climate change, uh, which complements or is done in conjunction with states' parties? 
Yes, I think I've spoken about it in uh, a few occasions, but yes, we've developed a Youth Climate Justice Handbook, uh, which is a tool to strengthen states' arguments before the court, and also for crafting what we call a youth annex. So the youth annex is to be attached to states' admissions, uh, which will contain arguments centered on intergenerational equity and more broadly human rights. So the youth annex can be a meaningful way for the youth and civil society in general to present and um, um, somehow tell the stories in front of the court because technically only states can present submissions um, before the International Court of Justice, but by providing a youth annex, youth and young people in general can meaningfully participate in the proceedings by um, reaching out to their governments and asking to be included or asked to include a youth annex. And the youth annex can be a, a document wherein they could tell uh, what we call evidence collection and the storytelling part. And what's very interesting about this is that um, it's not only limited to the International Court of Justice, and I had uh, a meeting recently with um, groups of young people at the International uh, Inter-American Court of Human Rights, and they're also doing a youth amicus brief, and they're calling for inputs from different uh, youth groups before the Inter-American Inter Court of Human Rights to create also similar to a youth annex. So this is an actual uh, avenue or place where young people and uh, civil society in general can actively participate in the proceedings. Well, thank you very much, Nishan and Nicole, uh, for giving a really good opening uh, discussion uh, for this event. Uh, we're now going to move on to the next two uh, panelists. Uh, but we'll come back near the, at the end. There'll be some questions and answers from the audience, uh, which so please stay on and don't leave us. Um, and some of those questions might relate to the issues which you were raising. Um, I'm now going to introduce Rebecca Schutt, who's the Executive Director of Citizens for Global Solutions, uh, who's uh, uh, co uh, chairing uh, this uh, event with myself. Uh, and she's going to introduce the next two panelists. Uh, Rebecca, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Alan, and apologies to all for my late arrival. Uh, it is quite early morning hours here in uh, the eastern seaboard of the United States and had some technical difficulties joining. I know you're in very capable hands with my friend and colleague, Alan Ware. It's my honor to introduce our next set of pan panelists, Augusto Lopez Cleros, uh, who's the executive director of the Global Governance Forum and a senior fellow at the Edmund Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. He's also the former director of the Global Indicators Group at the World Bank. And uh, Dr. Justin Sublin, who is an international lawyer and PhD candidate at the University of Auckland, New Zealand, co-coordinator of the Earth Trusteeship Working Group and co-editor of the book, Reflections on Earth Trusteeship, Mother Earth and a New 21st Century Governance Paradigm. Augusto and Justin, it is a pleasure to be with you both virtually. Um, Augusto, thank you for the time that you've taken with um, both of our organizations, the World Federalist Movement and uh, Citizens for Global Solutions over the past month. And Justin, thank you for bringing your new insights and initiatives to this conversation. As we move from considerations of international law and specifically how uh, citizens and civil society can engage with international justice institutions, um, I think we will pivot a little bit to your proposals for international institutions that can solve uh, some of the economic inequalities and some of the um, uh, systemic issues with uh, that balance the needs of humanity and our planet itself. So in your writings, both of you consider institutional responses. Um, Augusto, you have worked with many international institutions and in your book, Global Governance Institutions for the 21st Century, which we'll put uh, a link to in the chat, uh, consider some new alternatives and ways in which we can grapple with the global commons. In, low, in lieu of a wholesale dismantling of global property order, how can existing global institutions like those you've worked with and new modalities like you present in your book address these issues? I'll go first to Augusto, and then Justin, I'm very interested to hear your perspective on some of the modalities that you propose. 
Augusto, please. Um, thank you very much, Rebecca. It's um, a pleasure to participate in this in this conversation with you and with all your colleagues um, all, all over the world. Um, it seems to me that uh, it would be helpful if we, um, the international community, states, uh, business business community, uh, civil society organizations, other stakeholders, perhaps recognize more explicitly the nexus that exists between poverty and inequality on the one hand and uh, peace, security, political stability on, on the other. You know, over, over the last uh, few decades, uh, we economists um, in international organizations in academia have learned a great deal about the relationship between, between these, two, these two areas. Um, we know, for instance, that increases in inequality as measured, for instance, by a Gini coefficient um, in countries um, that are already established democracies, that um, the, 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 the institutional underpinnings of democracy tend to be weakened when inequality rises. Um, we also know that for those countries which have not yet made the transition, you know, from other forms of government, authoritarianism and or sort of imperfect forms of democracy into full democracy, that an increase in inequality um, will actually delay this transition and, and make the whole process more brittle. So these, these connections are already well established. And, and the logic, I think, is, is intuitive, you know. If the economy, um, if the economic system, if public policies are not delivering opportunity, are not uh, creating more equity in society, are not increasing uh, sort of the level of welfare uh, in, in society, then voters will be disappointed. And they will vote for demagogues, they will have nothing to lose, and when they feel that they have nothing to lose, they will put their political hopes, you know, on on authoritarians, on demagogues, and other people who, of course, have no way to deliver, uh, you know, on on these um, on these concerns, and so this is this is fairly well established. So the question then, if one recognizes this connection, is is you know how does one confront uh, these issues, and what's the role of international organizations, and more broadly governments and the business community? And here I like to start. By, by saying that I think that we need to admit that we actually have a worse poverty problem than, than we are ready to admit. And by we, I mean international organizations and, and sort of governments in, in general. You know, there is a certain kind of narrative about what has happened with poverty in the last few, few decades, which stresses the fact that extreme poverty as defined by the World Bank, which is in relation to a particular poverty line, that that measure you know, has improved uh, in the last uh, three decades. And, and this is true, if, especially if you start out uh, you know, somewhere way back, let's say 1990, some 30 some years ago, we have seen uh, improvements in, in uh, poverty, poverty reduction. Uh, the headcount has come down you know, from something like 2 billion people back in 1990 to about 700 million people last year. But two, two qualifications here. The first one is that this is essentially very much a China story to a lesser extent an India story. Uh, these reductions in extreme poverty have been very focused on, on a couple of countries. The other one, which is a more, more important point in some sense, is that, is that the, the extreme poverty definition, which is embedded in, for instance, SDG number one, uh, or you know, our sort of public policy dialogue on poverty, is an extremely austere line. Um, if you are extremely poor, then it basically means that you are living on the edge of survival. You don't. You, you are likely to be malnourished. You don't have access to social security and and you know basic infrastructures, uh, uh, whatever you know, electricity, uh, potable water, um, uh, you know, social security, and so on. So, if you actually use a less austere 
a poverty line, something like $6.85, it turns out that, uh, which still leaves people struggling, by the way, all right? So it's easy to characterize these people as being poor in some, in some objective sense. It turns out that 47% of the world's population is, is poor according to this, this definition of poverty, right? So, so clearly we, we, we have a problem. And, and then of course, on the inequality side, um, you know, we, are, we have traditionally focused on Gini coefficients at the national level, right? And so we say, uh, well, you know, there are something like, uh, we have data for about 120 or so countries. And then we say that some of the highest Gini coefficients in the world are located in Latin America and some countries in Africa. And these tend to be around 50, a little higher than 50. And yet in recent I would say over the last 10 years, um, some academics, and this is actually being used by the World Bank, have developed a, a kind of a much broader measure of inequality. It's a, go a global Gini coefficient where you don't establish distinctions between nations and you basically calculate a, a measure of inequality for the whole world's population for 8 billion people. And this, this metric, this number is at the moment, it's about 63, which is sky high. I mean, it's just, higher than the Gini coefficient of any other country in, in the world, right? So we, we have this very, very serious problem of, of inequality as world, which interacts in very toxic ways with poverty and with, with political stability. Um, there is a lot that I want to say, but I will split my remarks in two parts. Perhaps we can come back uh, in, in a few minutes, but let me just make one more point. One question is, you know, how does one tackle this, this problem? Um, incidentally, we have seen some reversals in poverty alleviation in the last couple of years. First, in 2020, because of the pandemic, there was a reversal for the first time in 30 years. And then um, more recently in 2022, because of the war in the Ukraine, you know, we have seen, um, again, deterioration both on in the inequality side as well as on the poverty side because of the disruptions to agricultural trade, uh, you know, inflation uh, and so on. Right? But, but this problem is actually amenable to solution. One way to tackle it uh, that comes to mind um, and is conceptually not, not a difficult problem to, to solve is, is to establish a safety net below which uh, no one, not, not one person in the world will be allowed to fall globally. Uh, we know where the poor are, for instance, you know, there's a group of about seven countries, India plus six countries in sub-Saharan Africa that basically have half of the, half of the world's extremely poor population. Um, so, um, we we have we have we have an idea of of you know where the the, the the largest pockets of poverty in the world are, and if you ask yourself what is the financial cost of pulling seven hundred million people out of extreme poverty through some kind of income subsidy scheme, you know, it turns out that it is a small fraction. Um, to be precise, one twentieth, okay, one twentieth of what we are spending today annually, uh, globally, on subsidizing energy. Right, as you know, energy subsidies are a huge, a huge uh, uh, sort of pocket of, of, of wasted resources. We're subsidizing gasoline, carbon, electricity, natural gas. Uh, the latest estimates from the IMF, uh, uh, which. Uh, which I think are from 2021, estimate these subsidies to be in the region of, you know, five and a half trillion dollars, which is about 6% of world GDP, right? This is magnitudes uh, 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 in scale larger than what would actually cost to establish a safety net for the 700 million people today, which we characterize as, as uh, extremely poor. And you would, of, co of course, you know, uh, uh, have other benefits. You know, if we did more on the subsidy, energy subsidy side, we would actually improve uh, income inequality because it's well known that these subsidies are very regressive. A lot of the benefits, 60% of the benefit of the gasoline subsidy goes to the top 20% of the income distribution. And of course, they also contribute to accelerate climate change. So there are these connections, you know, where better public policies um, 
a more honest debate about expenditure priorities uh, across the planet, you know, would have beneficial implications for inequality, would have beneficial implications for mitigating climate change and so on. Um, I have more to contribute to this particular sort of line of discussion, but perhaps I will pause here and uh, give you, Rebecca, the opportunity to go on uh, with uh, Justin, and then we can come back to some of these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Augusto, for that incredibly rich um, opening salvo of um, concrete policy ideas, uh, particularly the interplay between uh, SDG 1 and 16. Um, we often hear about false trade-offs um, between uh, de democratic initiatives and other goals that the SDGs um, uh, posit and try to advance. Um, I would love to return a little bit more to how the Vox Populi can engage with some of these questions, um, given that they are intergenerational, as our, our, the very title of our panel implies, um, beyond the uh, scope of any one um, administration or um, perhaps um, even any one generation. And to that end, I think that's a fitting segue over to Justin. Uh, Justin, um, one model and framework that has gained some recent traction is the concept of Earth trusteeship. And this is something that transcends um, a single um, political administration and transcends borders um, and transcends uh, time. Uh, it's based on a model and framework that the Earth is one integrated system that's not owned by anyone and that private property and territorial sovereignty exist as subsets of this one global system. So what would be required to bring global governance and international in law with this Earth trusteeship approach? Thank you very much, um, Rebecca. And of course, I am delighted to be here. Good, good night or good evening from Auckland, New Zealand. I'm delighted to be here, of course, with my um, my, my co-panelist, Augusto. Very well um, pleased to meet you as well and to listen to your topic. Uh, what is Earth trusteeship? I think that's the, the way we should start off. Um, it's a new a fairly new um, governance uh, model with respect um, to how we um, govern our relationship with the planet, how we govern our relationship with the community of life, how we govern our relationship with nature, and of course, human rights. So it brings in, uh, it's a kaleidoscope or a melting pot of different uh, typical issues. Um, who owns the earth? Uh, that that is, uh, it may sound uh, very um, a bold question. Uh, may sound nonsensical, um, in a sense. Um, but when we say who owns the earth for earth trusteeship, uh, the response to that would be uh, it's a bit of an oxymoron. It would be uh, we all do, but more correctly, none of us do, uh, because the earth itself is what we would call. Um, res nullis. It's um, in Latin means it's nobody's thing. Uh, it means that um, it means that it's a kind of no man or no woman's land. Um, because technically speaking, you'll be kind of um, outrageous to say I own the earth uh, because nobody owns the earth. And that's when you get into the issue which you mentioned about property, private property. Uh, but why Earth is important, not only because it's our, um, of course, our that's one thing we have with each other um, in terms of relationships with each other. Uh, we, um, you know, um, you have religion, you have um, race, you have ethnicity, you have nationalities. But there's one thing that is common is that we all live on one planet, and that's the Earth. But when you look at it, um, in 1979, uh, you had the Moon Agreement, for example. And the Moon Agreement specifically uh, um, excluded the Earth. If you look at Article 2, I believe, it specifically said it does not apply to the Earth. The Moon Agreement applies to the Moon and other planets. Um, and it said the Moon is a place for peaceful purposes. The Moon is a common heritage of mankind, which of course, to, to be gender neutral, um, but this was in 1979, 43, 44 years ago. 
So they specifically excluded the earth. So um, that is something that, you know, in international law, as of today, the earth has no international legal status. So earth trusteeship is the institutionalization of the duty to protect the earth and the integrity of earth's ecosystems or ecological systems. It's an altruistic concept uh, uh, because we, what we are saying, if we, the Hague principles, I wouldn't want to get into that too much, but the Hague principles was what actually, uh, there was a meeting which actually uh, with stakeholders, civil society, in, in um, 2018 that came together and, and formed these the Hague principles. And um, it says that the human being, the trustees of the earth are the, um, uh, is the state and citizens. So it's a joint collaborative effort. So we are trustees for the earth. We hold the earth in trust for the future generations, um, for even for other living beings. Now, Earth trusteeship is not something that, okay, we are trustees for the earth. It's not that we expect a check in the morning, uh, in the mail every month to say that, um, okay, this is my um, contribution for holding the earth in trust. No, it is a selfless, it is an altruistic concept. Um, so, you know, you are putting your the planet before your, your own self. Now, when it comes to private property, um, that's an issue that we just spoke about. Uh, Earth trusteeship challenges us to rethink the existing idea of property ownership, uh, property rights. Um, um, it says that um, it doesn't intend to dispense with uh, traditional property, private property rights, but it realizes that we have um, certain obligations or new dimensions of property ownership, if you want to put it that way. We have ownership obligations. Everybody speaks about human rights. Or what rights do I have? Um, um, you know, I have a right, freedom of expression. I have property rights. But we talk about rights in this type of vacuum. But no one speaks about what are your responsibilities. Because with rights come responsibilities. They work in tandem. Uh, so it causes us to rethink. Not to, not to dispense, but to rethink how we deal with uh, like the global commons, for example, um, which is the, and I'll get into that a little bit some more, the atmosphere, outer space, oceans. Uh, so the thing is, when you speak about private property, that in itself does not mean that you have, um, it's absolute. It doesn't mean uh, when you have private property, even when you look at private, it doesn't mean that's absolute ownership because with private property, uh, you also have to use your property uh, to make sure that it meets the legitimate expectations or of, of the public or the public interests of others. For example, uh, you have um, you might have a private property with a, a river flowing in your backyard. That does not mean that you can pollute that river because if you pollute that river, river it would cause damage to the ecosystems or even to um, downstream neighbors who uh, the stream flows through. So private property in itself does not necessarily mean that you have absolute ownership. You have to use your property in such a manner that it would be, of course, um, not to conflict with your neighbors or the public interests of others. Uh, so I also wanna speak about uh, a little bit of Gandhi's trusteeship, which is um, Mahatma Gandhi, of course, it's, um, he has a philosophical way of speaking about his trusteeship, which earth trusteeship could attune to. So for example, Gandhi's trusteeship was that it was a short, it was a kind of social corporate responsibility. He said, um, and it applies to us today, and I'll get into that. He said that the wealthy in society um, are not owners of their wealth, uh, but they should use their wealth to um, satisfy their what they need, what they reasonably need for their personal needs. But the excess of that wealth should be held in trust for the society. Right? As utopian as that songs, um, Gandhi's act was actually trying to um, deal with situations that I saw, I listened to Augusto, he, he mentioned the same thing, deal with situations which we are facing today. Now, this is 75 years ago, Gandhi passed away in 1948. 
so the situation we have today is there is a huge, a gigantic um, form of inequality of wealth in our um, society, in our international community. I have a quote from Oxfam in 2023. One of the latest quotes is that they said that the richest 1% of the world have accumulated nearly two thirds of all the new wealth created since 2020. Uh, Augusto gave some, some, some um, figures there, um, which I thought was also very, um, was very interesting uh, that we have the money, we have the resources, if we reduce the subsidies and the oil and gas and industry and everything else, if the richest 1% of the world could um, massively contribute or massively reduce poverty. When you're talking about 1% of the population as two thirds of the world's wealth, um, that shows um, that, so in other words, this is something that Gandhi was trying to address even in, in, in the 1940s. So this is what earth trusteeship is really about. I will touch briefly on sovereignty a little bit because um, that was another issue in terms of sovereignty. Sovereignty, we are moving away now um, from a model of traditional idea of sovereignty where um, sovereignty, this was in maybe, uh, if you look back in the 14th, 15th century, uh, Jean Boudin and um, also the, the Westphalia, the Westphalia model, for example, sovereignty was something absolute, something unfettered. The king who is or the, who is in charge, um, you can say a word to go against what the king ordered or the king's command. And even they sell uh, with Westphalia, you you know it was um, it was exclusionary, right? So it was every man, every nation standing for their own. So we're moving away from that concept to so more not sovereignty as absolute but sovereignty as a form of responsibility. Um, cooperation, as, as you see with the United Nations. Um, um, but trusteeship now, for example, um, those who are against trusteeship would say that trusteeship limits state sovereignty. Because if you say the state is a trustee for the earth, then that means that the state cannot do what it wants to the earth. So the state, because you act as trustees for the beneficiaries, so you don't own the earth, you're holding the earth in trust for someone else. So you're merely, you merely have to do what the trust, what the beneficiaries put you there to do, what the future generations, they put you there for you. So there'll be no more um, um, deep, deep um, sea bed uh, mining, um, for instance, for example. Uh, so in a sense, state trust, um, trusteeship limits state sovereignty. But then there's a flip side to that argument that says that trusteeship is not really limited um, state sovereignty because it actually empowers, it doesn't downgrade sovereignty because it assigns important tasks um, to, the, to the state. States now have obligations to the earth. They have obligations to humanity, obligations to the community of life. They have obligations in terms of how we are going to manage these global commons which is, um, of course, the oceans, the atmosphere, um, space even. How are we going to manage this for humanity? So that's actually a big portfolio for the states. Um, um, and so that is something that um, there's not really a conflict um, with trusteeship and sovereignty. So I'll just go into my the wind down now with the, what can be done. Uh, as we said, the Gandhi's tr um, trusteeship is a bit utopian. Um, some will say... Um, Earth trusteeship is ecotopia. Uh, it's a it's made up of green stuff um, and, and out of there's something of course the reality out of whack with reality. Uh, but the challenge. But that being said, there is there are some challenges with earth trusteeship. Uh, how do we overhaul this dominant uh, system that we have um, that follows a neoliberal market economy? Do we have an overhaul um, of the capitalist system? Uh, I mentioned the figures the, from Oxfam and plutocracy, um, the rich, that 1%, would they be able to um, influence governmental decisions? Could they influence, influence trustees, the states, to not, be, to not engage themselves in, in their trusteeship duties? Because the whole, the whole object of a trust is that you must trust the trustees, right? 
using the English. Of course, trustee come from the word trust. You must trust the trustees to do their job. The future generations put their trust in the state to do their job. But what about that rich 1%? Um, so that's the obvious thing. Can state, are states fit to be trustees? But when you look at the flip side of it, um, um, all other models have failed. They have failed us, um, that 99% that doesn't have the wealth, uh, and they've also failed the planet and uh, all the uh, living um, or the community of life. So we need what I think um, for the youth coming today, the law is hopelessly bereft of force, soul, vigor, moral obligation. We need some new consciousness of law. Uh, and this was, I got this new consciousness of law point from um, uh, Albert Schweinscher, who was uh, um, a Nobel laureate. And um, he spoke about, and this was in 1929, so this is almost 100 years ago, he said, we need a new consciousness of law. So my thesis is that earth trusteeship could be that new consciousness of law. It could be that model which does not fail both us, humanity, community of life, and the planet. So I think I would leave it by there. I'm sorry if I went aboard too much, but I, I think I'll leave it there for further questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Justin. Uh, absolutely riveting. Um, I think what you gesture towards um, is nothing less than a remaking of the global consciousness um, from consu consumer to conservator, from entitlement to altruism, from a personal way of thinking to the planetary method of uh, exploring our shared obligations uh, and therefore our shared rights um, on this earth. So I'd like to, and with limited time uh, available, bring this um, home in terms of some concrete next steps. We have an opportunity in front of us in form of the current sustainable development goals uh, that exist to 2030. We're almost at the halfway mark and those that might exist beyond. Um, so Augusto first maybe, and then coming back to Justin, how can we utilize and seize this moment of action to realize some of the ambitious undertakings uh, that you both present? And I'm also quite interested in how you would translate this for the layperson. Um, both of you made references to the Earth's largest democracy as uh, a home for uh, the most systemic in inequalities in some ways, and also um, the, the cradle of some of the greatest hope in the, in the form of Mahatma Gandhi's concepts. So if we were to go to India, if we were going to my home country in the United States, how might we translate for the common citizen, the global citizen, uh, some of these concepts and what they, they can do in addition to what state action can be uh, harnessed in the realm of the SDGs? So Augusto, over to you. Um, thank you, Rebecca. Um, it, it seems to me that the approach that we have used in recent decades uh, to tackle, um, you know, glo global problems, uh, uh, I mean, climate change perhaps is the one that comes uh, immediately to mind, although there are, there are others, uh, poverty, inequality, uh, you know, sort of the uh, militarism and so on. It, it, that, that particular approach Oh, is is not working. Let me be more specific. Uh, you know, looking at climate change in particular, the most recent uh, sort of important initiative in this in this area was perhaps the 2015 Paris Agreement, and yet we know that that we are we are that particular uh, institutional framework for tackling climate change is not working. Emissions have continued to rise. The commitments that were made at that at that uh, summit uh, were were voluntary. We don't have a, a a system in place where you know these commitments are binding, where where we penalize countries for not fulfilling them, and for that reason, um, you know, the system is kind of broken. And so, when I think, you know how can we change this dynamic you know of initiatives of international cooperation would essentially are not resolving the problems that we face um i think that you know we need to essentially uh introduce reforms into the global governance architecture 
that will make it feasible to basically have binding solutions to these problems. Let me give you just a couple of examples, all right? There is a, a great deal of talk today, as you well know, about financing the transition to a renewable energy economy. Um, the experts, the scientists, the economists have already told us that over the next 15 years, we literally need to spend tens of trillions of dollars, you know, to make this transition possible. And, and yet, you know, within the existing institutional framework, within the existing institutions that we have, that is not feasible. And, and let, let me be more specific. Um, for instance, when you think, you know, where could the funding come, you know, to finance this transition? Um, well, one thought that comes to mind, and this is the economist speaking, is a tax on financial, financial transactions. You know, the financial sector has grown uh, enormously in recent decades. It is, it is a huge part of the global economy. The debate that we had in the 1970s about the Tobin tax has, has, emer has sort of evolved. And today there is something called a Robin Hood tax, which would, uh, even at a very small, a small rate, generate literally hundreds of billions of dollars per year um, that could go towards not only uh, financing this transition to a renewable energy economy, but to dealing with some of the other urgent problems that we have on the social side, poverty, inequality, and so on. And yet this cannot be done unless you do something uh, like make the introduction of this tax an obligation, let's say, of membership in the IMF and the World Bank. Um, you know, without some kind of uh, binding commitment, it's not going to work, right? Um, the, uh, the IMF is another potential source of uh, huge funding uh, for this transition. Um, the SDR, you know, the IMF is the only organization in the world that actually creates global liquidity. They do occasionally what are called issues of SDR, which is a free form of liquidity which can go to support countries' budgets. Um, but in order to be able to do this on a regular basis, in a way that is non-inflationary, but that meets these, these important needs, um, you probably need to amend the articles of the IMF, which again involves you know, a, a, a level of commitment that we have not yet seen so far when it comes to international cooperation. So for me, this is, this is vital. And otherwise, we're going to continue to be in this very toxic dynamic, where on the one hand, we have recognition of these problems. We are all alarmed about what is happening on the climate change side, but somehow this alarm and this sense of impending danger does not translate into meaningful solutions on the ground that actually make a difference. On your second question, you know, I am a great supporter of the uh, idea that these global solutions actively necessitate the involvement of civil society organizations. All the major initiatives of international cooperation that, that uh, 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 have taken place in the last, let's say, 20 years, 25 years, uh, from the creation of international criminal court to the more latest one, the, the, uh, uh, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, uh, and others as well, including the Paris Agreement in 2015, this would not have been possible without the active engagement of citizens, of uh, civil society organizations. We are obviously going to have to be part of the solution. Governments have vested interests in, in the status quo. They are managing the next 12 months. They are typically focused on short-term crises. They don't have the bandwidth, and sometimes they don't have the political will to look at the broader setting and to do the kinds of things that are necessary to address these global problems. So it will have to be us who provide the solutions, who put pressure on the politicians, who um, join forces with other like-minded organizations in civil society to begin to alert um, our politicians, our business community, that unless we make these institutional innovations, unless we come up with schemes that actually deliver solutions, then we have a very dark future. And, 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 and I think that, you know, it's not inconceivable that we might see in, in coming years a collapse of our existing uh, global order. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Augusto. Um, I'm mindful that I've transgressed, I think, my time and asked the forgiveness of my uh, co-moderator. But Justin, picking up on this, 
can we take the occasion of the Summit for the Future? Can we take the occasion um, of the SDG um, revisitation um, as a rallying point for civil society, for citizens as a whole, for concrete action? Um, and if so, how? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you again. Yeah, the summit for the future. Um, the second, the 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 secretary general did is your report, our common future. And um, in it, um, he uh, he specifically spoke about the repurposing of the UN Trusteeship Council. As some of us may know, the UN Trusteeship Council is one of the five organs, uh, principal organs of the United Nations, and it has been defunct. I mean, it was dealing with um, with uh, um, trusteeship of nations um, who were less bringing nations who were less developed nations who were quote well were in a sense um, um, trying to find their feet, especially after the World War. So the trusteeship system, Palau was the last was the last country, and um, so that was in 1991. Palau became um, independent, and since 1991, the trusteeship council has not been um, well. They have been sitting uh, irregularly, but um, they have not been. They, they are a defunct organization. So how can we use this repurpose we, we, this UN trusteeship council and um, make it more? Um, uh, Effective. It, so it speaks about a uh, UN reform. Um, I would like to see coming out of the summit for the future, um, of course, Earth trusteeship. Um, uh, um, but we have to be realistic. At the end of the day, the states are the ones who are going to ne negotiate um, what happens out of this high level advisory board report, um, which was created by the UN Secretary General. Uh, won't get into too much detail, but there are many there are many suggestions or proposals. Kofi Annan um, um, made a proposal for having the UN Trusteeship Council um, be governing the global commons. Uh, um, Earth Trusteeship, of course, um, in a sense, appeals to that um, how we can use the unknown, um, uh, that's something that is well known, something that is institutionalized in the UN system um, can be a body that would deal with the global commons. Uh, so I, I think that um, uh, the, the, the high level advisory board spoke about um, trusteeship. We must act for, uh, for current and future generations can only be met if we act in trusteeship for the planet. So that is language that we would like to see as well. Um, but at the end of the day, this is something that uh, is a matter for the states to decide upon. Uh, but we have on board, for example, the Parliament of World Religions, they also support this idea of using the UN, UN, um, the UN Trusteeship Council to act in the best interests of the future generations, and to manage the global commons. Uh, so Another aspect that I would like to see, and I'll just touch on this briefly, is the envoy for future generations. Uh, I think that is, if you would want to say, that is something that would gain more traction for member states. Um, that is where we have an envoy that linking environmental rights to the legal obligations that we have for future generations. So it's interesting to see how the outcome of this, um, this summit for the future will be in 2024. And um, I look forward to see how that unravels. And um, uh, yeah, and we see how Earth Trusteeship could have a role to play with that. And it's interesting because around that same time, we will possibly have the legal arguments beginning in the International Court of Justice Advisory Opinion for Climate Change. So I think there's a lot of interesting um, dimensions taking place uh, with Earth Trusteeship um, between um, this year and 2024. So I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Uh, thank you both so much for your time. As I segue to Alan and our final pair of panelists, I commend everybody's attention. Some of the initiatives that are mentioned in the chat um, that are means for mobilizing around these ideas. Also, just as a reminder, in the question and answer function, we are taking questions, comments on a rolling basis and hope to have some time to engage more deeply with these ideas. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Augusto. Over to you, Alan. 
Thank you very much, Rebecca. And for the final mini panel, we're going to uh, focus on action to implement obligations to eliminate nuclear weapons and to phase out fossil fuel economy uh, in order to bring a green economies to protect the climate for future generations. Uh, we have two incredible uh, speakers to introduce the topic and to have some conversation about this. First is uh, Tadashi Unuzuka, who's a former senator from Nagasaki. Uh, he is the co-president of World Federalist Movement uh, Institute for Global Policy. Uh, he's also the executive director of the 3 plus 3 coalition for a Northeast Asia nuclear weapon free zone and a council member of parliamentarians for nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament. Uh, welcome Tadashi, wonderful to have you here. Um, and the other panelist with us is a wonderful um, uh, youth activist uh, from India. Disha Ravi, who is the co-founder of Fridays for Future in India. I'm um, very engaged in mobilizing and acting youth, but also youth working in conjunction with other uh, civil society actors working on climate change issues. Disha, wonderful to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'll start with the nuclear weapons issues and so swing to Tadashi first. Um, and looking at in order to move from a world that is still um, based a lot and uh, with a large number of countries still relying on nuclear deterrence for security in order to move to a nuclear weapons free world we're going to need to be able to shift this mindset of the governments and build the the confidence in security without relying on nuclear weapons so Tadashi can you give some comments about how we can do this um, and whether doing it in a regional way can help can regional models like the proposal you're working on uh, northeast asia uh, nuclear weapon free zone can they help in this in this process and how would they build about the idea of security without relying on nuclear weapons tadashi the floor is yours thank you alan thank you for this uh, great opportunity of uh, sharing what we are doing here in northeast asia uh, what we can do is uh, we started with the question of what we, I mean, Japan, South Korea, for instance, can do uh, right now uh, as a concrete action, something we can approach uh, like a global issue of disarmament. Disarmament of a nuclear weapon uh, has been always in the hands of uh, you know, big countries, superpowers. Uh, P5, uh, and we 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 have very very little influence over this. But uh, as far as uh, nuclear weapon free zone is concerned, uh, nuclear weapon free zone uh, is defined as by the United Nations that must start by the free initiative of within the zone countries. So just like Mongolia, for instance. Uh, Mongolia achieved a uh, single state nuclear weapon free zone status uh, from the uh, United Nations uh, General Assembly and easing uh, the tension between Russia and China uh, significantly. And that means uh, regional issue impacting a global uh, issue. Uh, this is a very good example. So uh, what we are trying to do is that uh, at the moment we are uh, cooperating with Japanese parliamentarians and South Korean parliamentarians. We are uh, very, very similar uh, uh, security situations under the extended deterrence uh, by the United, Nation, United States uh, nuclear weapons. And we are increasing our defense budget Japan announced we are going to double the defense budget, which is uh, which is enormous. We have to cut down uh, all the other uh, social, uh, educational aspects. Uh, it's going to be 100 billion US dollar very soon. And South Korean case, their defense budget is more than GDP of North Korea. So we are spending a lot of money. Uh, how to uh, shift this trend uh, of, uh, uh, of increasing the defense budget to a dialogue-based 
uh, confidence building. Now we have a very good base, which is six party talk. Six party means North and South Korea, Japan, three countries, and then surrounding nuclear, nuclear weapon countries, uh, Russia, US, and China. And this is the six party uh, talk countries. And we can make use of this uh, six party talk uh, framework uh, by using three plus three comprehensive approach, which was uh, uh, proposed by uh, Dr. Moton Halperin. Uh, he, he used to be the advisor to the Clinton administration. Now, three plus three means within the zone, nuclear weapon free zone uh, countries are three, North and South Korea and Japan. And another three is the US, China, and Russia promising the negative security uh, assurance. That means promising and signing the international uh, treaty saying we don't attack this area or threaten the area by the nuclear weapons. Now, uh, what we are using the, uh, this image of a nuclear weapon free zone is a Korean uh, Peninsula Green Belt. Uh, it's just like a German Green Belt after the Cold War ended. Uh, the building wall fell, but this uh, really long uh, German, you know, border uh, separated East and West became a symbol of peace, unification, and flourish, flourishment, flourishing the, the uh, natural uh, beauties. And the same thing is happening in Korean Peninsula, width of four kilometers and length of 250 kilometers area is already a Korean green belt because it is covered by the landmines, wire fence, watchtowers, and no human development has been done in this area. So it's already a green belt. So what we are proposing is ending the Korean war. Uh, that is a three plus three comprehensive approach. And then supporting this area economically energy, and then establishing, establishing regional security council. And then finally, we agree on, on the each sentences of the three plus three international treaty for the Northeast Asia nuclear weapon free zone. Now, to, to go in forward this, we have already organized parliamentarians for the, the three plus three uh, with both nations, uh, ROK and Japan. We have done uh, quite a few uh, visio conferences an in-person conference was held uh, last year, uh, August the 9th, the commemoration day of the Nagasaki bombing. We invited Korean parliamentarians to Nagasaki. And then in return, uh, Japanese parliamentarians visited uh, May of this year to Seoul. And we have agreed upon the model treaty for the Northeast Asia nuclear weapon free zone. Now we are ready to visit Washington DC to meet and exchange opinion with the like-minded U.S. Uh, senators and representatives. Uh, thank you, Alan. Tadashi, thank you very much. Um, and you, in talking about the Northeast Asia nuclear weapon-free zone, you put forward not just a, a framework for the elimination of nuclear weapons in the region uh, through a common security approach, uh, which meets the security needs of, of all of the countries there, but you also put forward the vision of something better that could come out of that, the demilitarization of uh, the, the, the DMZ of the zone and turning that into like a UNESCO heritage park, for example, such as the one that is in, in, in Germany, which is really interesting. I think, you know, putting forward, you know, like the visions um, of positive things which can come out of peace processes, in addition to the ending of the hostility and moving away from the nuclear threats. So having that, you know, that positive um, visions is really important as part of the campaigns and inspiring people to get involved. So thank you very much for both of those elements in your introductory comments. Um, I'm going to swing over now to Disha with regards to some of the same sort of ideas in terms of uh, moving to net zero carbon economies. 
that how can we envision this as a possibility and as a positive thing and not just seen as something that is is making things more difficult economically for people moving away from fossil fuel we need to inspire you know people in our campaigns that this is a positive thing what are some of the the ways that you're doing this in the campaigns that you're involved in um in order to be able to increase people's uh, uh support um and feeling of security and moving to a uh, green economies and away from fossil fuels Disha, the floor is yours um, thank you so much. I think firstly, I'd like to start off by saying that there are already several economies who have shown us that net zero uh, economy it can be a reality. To name some, Bhutan, Panama, and Suriname have been have been net zero for years now, and they've been leading discussions uh, in different conferences, in different negotiations, and urging other countries to be net zero. Uh, they have showed that moving from a fossil fuel based economy to a greener economy is possible and governments and populations will need to contribute to this. Uh, governments can do this to diplomacy and cooperation. Uh, governments should prioritize diplomatic efforts and promote co cooperation among nations to build trust and address security concerns. One of the uh, most important points is that a lot of climate negotiations right now aren't legally binding, and there is a lot of push for it to be legally binding so that global, global countries and especially the global north can be held accountable for their actions. Um, they should, government should also work towards strengthening existing multilateral agreements, such as the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, as well as something that I've been working on is the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty, which is a very helpful guide on how to move away from fossil fuel economies to a greener economies that's built on renewable energy resources. Um, and I would encourage more and uh, countries to join these agreements. We need a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, and this can provide a framework for disarmament as well as non-proliferation efforts across the world. We also need more transparency and verification. We need to establish robust mechanisms for transparency and verification, as it is crucial to building confidence among nations. Uh, right now, there is a lot of talk, but not enough action. Um, so government should aim to change this by committing to sharing information, allowing inspections and implementing verification measures to ensure, ensure compliance with both disarmament and environmental commitments, which should align ourselves with the SDGs. Uh, government should prioritize the SDGs and invest in green technology and infrastructure by promoting economic cooperation and providing financial assistance countries can create opportunities for a smooth transition to a green economy by both ensuring security and stability for all and uh, coming to the part of uh, creating awareness and public education uh, this is something we have been working on for ages um, in countries like my own india uh, knowledge about the climate crisis or the nuances of the climate crisis is in public knowledge it isn't freely available uh climate education is limited to very uh private elite schools that isn't accessible by the majority so we have been uh working with journalists to make sure that the the urgency of the situation is heard through press through national news and by also ensuring that we're creating curriculums for schools so that they can engage in uh, healthy discussions around what uh, around climate solutions and around what individuals as well as collectives can do. So this is going to be a long battle, but we have to get started. Um, and I think another great example of a net zero economy is Costa Rica, which has been running on 98% renewable energy for several years. Um, all these examples can serve as models and inspirations for other countries in their transition to a net zero economy. Thank you very much, uh, Disha, for this. I'm going to actually circle back to you first and then come back to Tadashi, because you've mentioned some of these examples of net zero economies. I think Vanuatu has also recently joined this. Um, 
And, and also sort of back to what Nicole was talking about earlier with regards to the International Court of Justice advisory opinion on states' responsibilities to protect the climate for future generation. Uh, do you think that, it's, that there's going to be some value of taking some of these examples into this case, not just the ICJ case, but also the ICLOS one and the Inter-American one? Um, and how might we be able to get you know, some of these examples elevated uh, both through legal and political means? Uh, in order to encourage other governments to see, hey, it's possible to have net zero economies and move quickly to that transition? Uh, that is a very good question. And I think this is something we have been pushing for at the subsidy bodies meeting that happened in Bonn in June. And this is also something we've been working on towards the SD summit, that's, uh, the SD climate ambition summit that's happening in New York, as well as COP, which is coming up in Dubai. Um, we need a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty and these countries have been pushing for it. Uh, like one of our two, like you mentioned, they also pushed for it recently. They have been setting examples of how this can be achieved in bigger countries. And most importantly, they have showcased uh, very clear steps on how they can actually achieve this. There have been, there is quite literally a step-by-step -step guide on what they can do, but it is being ignored at the moment. Um, and there is always the question of how can we inspire uh, countries across the world to do this? But in reality, they should be leading the charge because every conference they gather and they uh, lead press conferences on how they are leaders of climate action, when in reality, they're much further behind. So it is um, high time that they that it becomes our responsibility to push them, but it is time for them to take charge um, and actually show some leadership and so, so show some humanity towards um, how they're taking care of the planet. Um, I think I was really moved by the trusteeship that the, the conversation around trusteeship that we had. And it just goes to show that we we need to have not just ownership across the on on the planet essentially, but responsibility for taking care of the planet. So moving towards that is something that the youth and other civil society movements have been doing for ages, and it's really time for world leaders to catch up. We have been telling them, we have been uh, saying this in many languages, in many beautiful words and action, but there hasn't been um, equal reciprocation. And we are at a point where we're showing them that if they don't continue to take action, we will, because protecting the earth is our priority and it should be their priority too. Thank you very, very much. Uh, and I've put, you've mentioned the fossil fuel, the campaign for the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty a couple of times. So that's put in the chat box for that. And of course, the key thing with the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty is moving from just looking at carbon emissions, which is basically what the COP process and the Paris Agreement are about, to looking at stopping the extraction of the fossil fuels. Uh, and that's a really important part, stopping it at source. Uh, so that's in there. I'm going to swing back now, and this will be the last question for this panel, um, and just uh, ask our people to, to be prepared to stay on for a bit, 10 minutes longer so that we can also have uh, questions, uh, and Rebecca will, will take on fielding the questions after this. But I just want to circle back quickly to Tadashi um, on the question of, because you mentioned uh, in working for the Northeast Asia nuclear weapon-free zone and in building security without nuclear weapons, that you're engaging parliamentarians. So you're bringing in, it's not just governments that we leave to negotiate these big security issues, but you're bringing in the role of parliamentarians. I would like to ask you to expand a little bit on that. You know, why is it important for parliamentarians to be involved? And also how can civil society and particularly youth engage with their parliamentarians to build more effective push to on political will and on these issues? Uh, so Tadashi, the, role, the importance of parliamentarians and how youth and civil society can work with parliamentarians on this. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. I think this is a very important uh, direction to have a truck 1.5 approach. That means along with the parliamentarians, 
uh, the you know, non-governmental, non-profit organization must support the contents, especially of the treaty. Because usually, uh, most of the time, parliamentarians are not interested in, uh, uh, in this kind of issue. They are more interested in easier to understand for the, for the voters, you know, for the election campaigns. They don't talk about Northeast Asia nuclear weapon free zone for the election campaign. And that makes it very, very difficult. However, uh, deep inside, of course, uh, in order to cut down the, for instance, 2% uh, of GDP defense budget, uh, we are already uh, ha having a very hard time to really implement in this kind of uh, budgetary plan. We don't have that kind of money. So instead of uh, building up this kind of money, we should really start the dialogue side by the parliamentarians supported by the NGOs. And uh, this is the, the key word. Instead of uh, pressure, we should have the dialogue for the confidence building. Uh, that, that will work uh, with uh, the most of the, the parliamentarians. Thank you. Thank you very much, Disha and Stasi. Um, I'm now going to pass uh, back to Rebecca uh, to field uh, some questions that have come in the question and answer box uh, and just indicate that I think we're going to extend this uh, webinar uh, 10 to 15 minutes in order to be able to address some of those questions. Uh, Rebecca, and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Alan. And Tadashi, just as we segue into the question and answer, we look very much forward to welcoming you to our legislature in the United States to pass on the message that you just shared. Um, this embarrassment of riches of our panelists has led us a little bit over time, but I hope that we are able to tackle some of the questions uh, in the chat. Uh, firstly, I think this is best framed for our, our first pair of panelists. We had some questions around the International Court of Justice cases. Um, uh, those uh, nuclear weapons, and also I think we could probably uh, include the um, pending climate case. We had a question on how civil society can interact and uh, influence ICJ decisions, and we also had a question on what the real world implications and impact of ICJ decisions might be, and uh, I welcome you to tackle either nuclear policy or climate or both. Um, so for Nicole, uh, Nishan, perhaps that first set of questions. Nicole, go ahead. I will follow you. Yes. Uh, thank you, Nishan. I thought those are great. Those are great questions. And the real world, I think I mentioned also earlier how they can uh, take part in the processes in the ICJ. So there's the um, before, I don't think it was very accessible. In fact, in our discussions with the government of Vanuatu and some civil society organizations, it often came up that a lot of states uh, mm. lack the technical and legal uh, support in coming up with their submissions to the ICJ. So there's actually that there's actually that gap. But now um, there's a lot of support behind the because of how historic it is, there's a lot of support around these submissions. And in fact, um, just the idea of, for example, the youth annex and how civil society organizations and youth and young people can take part in the proceedings, even though um, technically only states can participate. I think that's such a huge um, win for young people and civil society in general. And I think the real world uh, implication or impact of that is that we get to be involved in our future and also in the conversations and arguments and also the fact that um, we could share our stories so the youth annex could be a way wherein the youth from different parts or different corners of the world can tell their stories or what's actually happening in their communities or how the effects of climate change or how um, how um, it's difficult for them to uh, achieve uh, peace in general in their communities or how it has affected them. And the youth annex is a way for them to sh share that and tell their stories. So that's one of the uh, real world implications and also how it can uplift, I think, as I mentioned earlier, the UNFCC process and also strengthen the goals with the Paris Agreement because 
the Paris Agreement, for example, is uh, voluntary on the part of the states, but for example, the advisory opinion can be used by uh, everyone because of its um, because of its non-contentious nature. So uh, that's on top of my head. I'm sure Nation can uh, build on to that. No, thank you. I think it's relevant. Uh, as I mentioned before, and to kind of support what Nicole was saying, I think the ICJAO on climate change is easily one of the most important cases to go before the World Court. And we mustn't forget that the World Court advisory opinion necessarily dictates the terms to all the member states of the United Nations when the judgment comes out. And I think uh, Whilst uh, there is key developers, and I put on the <clears throat> kind of the chat, the allowing uh, the IUCN and the Commission of Small Island Development States to engage, you know, there's wider group of civil society engaged in the IUCN, for example, there's something called the World Commission on Environmental Law. And this is not just for lawyers, this is for wider civil society to engage. And if you go to the IUCN website, there are key contact focal points. You can send in your written submission to, to them and ask how to engage in these processes. But I think we should not stop there and stop at member states only. When we say civil society, I think this is an opportunity to retell the stories in a different way that we really tried our best at the beginning of this century. For example, in the Scandinavian countries, there are the Sami, the indigenous group. They don't have a country. They don't belong to Norway, Sweden, Finland, or, uh, or, or Russia, but they cut across the, all of those countries. But can Sami go to the International Court of Justice? That's a question mark I want to ask everybody here, not just the lawyers. Can we have a representation from them? Can they engage with, for example, the Swedish state to give them a voice before the International Court of Justice? I think we need to ask these difficult questions because if the Sami is represented before the International Court of Justice, we will definitely have a wider objective of achieving or realizing a trusteeship that we were speaking of. Can there be partnerships between the global north and the global south through civil society, putting pressure on your respective governments? Because there are so many countries in the global south who just does not have the money uh, to come to The Hague to appear. If so, can we have partnerships? I think that's where the global civil, civil society has a very good opportunity to, to act and bring the stories of how climate change, not merely in the Pacific Island state where the situation is really, really terrible, but across the world where islands and others are really being impacted by this change. And it is an opportunity to build a broader base of respect for international law and international environmental law. So I think there are various remedies and to capture or, or as, as, as Nicole and her team as they really capture the imagination of modern day uh, humans to bring about change. Uh, thank you, Nishan. And your mention of the of the Sami um, brings to mind uh, the some causes in in my own hemisphere, um, where indigenous populations are having enormous impact, um, belated but enormous impact within the inter American court system. Um, our next set of questions, I think, is best addressed to our second set of panelists. So thank you, Nishan and Nicole. I'm not sure if Augusto had to drop or not, um, but. All of these solutions that we posited, both with existing institutions and those that, that could be made, are premised on confidence in organizations. And confidence, of course, is belied by corruption. And so we had a question or set of questions around how to co combat corruption um, to achieve goal, global goals and the, the climate peace disarmament nexus. Um, I'll couple that with another question for you, Justin, um, and you can choose either or both. Um, but the second would be how to instill um, a, a positive reaction or positive buy-in from the private sector and, and business sector for the concept of Earth trusteeship. So please, two, two different but interrelated questions, I think, and how to achieve some of the aims that we have set out. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for those questions. Uh, um, they're very good questions. Uh, I wouldn't answer the corruption question because I think that may be <laughs> a little bit out of my 40. But I think the question on uh, how some positive buying buy in from um, private, um, private industry, private, private firms on earth trusteeship. I think one of the 
one of the positive buy buy ins is that unlike the Gandhi's trusteeship, which Gandhi says that um, he says that my trusteeship, nobody should, there's he wants to abolish all private property, um, which of course in those days, and we're speaking about um, maybe the 30s, the 40s, that would have been very radical. Even today, that is still very a, a radical approach to say there would be no private property ownership. Uh, but Earth Trustship is saying that, okay, we understand that there's a traditional model of private property that exists. Um, we are not calling for the total um, demolition of that particular structure. But we are saying that um, there are other forms of um, ownership obligations. If you want to, I mean, we don't like to use the word ownership because technically you don't own the earth, but there are other form, uh, forms of obligations that you have. So in other words, um, you can look at it two ways. You can look private property, which I said is not absolute because when you have private property, you still, I mean, that's a whole concept with land law. You still have to use your property in such a way that doesn't cause any nuisance or any form of damage to your neighbor's property. But we are not trying to dispense with that property ownership, but we are trying to say that you have universal obligations. So we're not we're moving away from that rights system. So what are your obligations? Um, so what are your obligations, not to your private property, but what are your obligations to the planet? What are your obligations to the community of life that is non-human life forms. Um, um, are you going to recycle? Are you going to do composting? Are you going to change your 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 diet? Consume less meat. Consume um, less animal products. Are you going for organic type of um, regime? Um, so these are the kind of um, that's what that that would be my buying. Um, to say that we are not trying to dismantle your property system, but we're just realizing, want you to know that you have certain obligations that you have for humanity and for the planet. I hope that helps. Very much so. Thank you so much, Justin. Um, I think we will link in the chat to Augusto Lopez Claros's book, since he had to drop, which contains a, a chapter on um, combating the scourge of corruption in governance institutions, current and envisioned. Um, I'd like to open this for either our last panel, pair of panelists, or for um, our, our set as a whole. Um, we have had a few questions about the very present um, and um, affecting conflict uh, and uh, case of aggression currently being exhibited in Ukraine. Um, are there current international law, is there current applicable international law and legal processes that can and are being employed um, with regards to this conflict? Um, and also, I'd like to bring this back to our the topic of today's dis discussion, which is on the climate disarmament nexus. What lessons can we learn from the ongoing conflict in Ukraine for uh, climate and disarmament issues? So I would open that up for everyone, but we haven't heard from our final set of panelists, so um, Disha and Dashi particularly. Go ahead, Disha. Oh, no, I was actually going to tell you because I think this is out of my knowledge area. So please go ahead. So I start, uh, you know, the, regarding the the topic of uh, Ukraine, uh, that, will, that will give us, us means Japan and North Asia, um, two lessons. One is nuclear, nuclear threat is real. For instance, a uh, U.S. submarine uh, carrying nuclear weapons uh, of five kiloton. Five kiloton means uh, the one dropped in Nagasaki had 21 kiloton, uh, killed 74,000 people in, in one shot. However, uh, you know, the uh, U.S. and Russia are capable of creating 2,000 times more uh, explosive power already. However, they are using they are deploying five kiloton. That means one fourth of Nagasaki type. That means they are ready to use it, and this is real. Um, and this is this is why we are really have to uh, push forward 
the dialogue as soon as possible. And another uh, you know, lesson that uh, we are taking from uh, Ukraine conflict is that, uh, for instance, what we can do, uh, Japan, Japan's case, uh, we have to promote the ceasefire, not promoting uh, the winning of one side, but we have to promote the ceasefire because we have never done uh, any um, political or military activities in that area. That means we don't have any image of our country in that area. And that makes us a good broker of the ceasefire. And that's what we are talking about right now. Thank you. Thank you, Tadashi. Um, that certainly sets, um, I think, in perspective, the current challenges that we are facing. I know that we're already over time. Um, I will hand it back to my co-moderator, Alan, for last words and conclusions. Uh, I want to thank um, all the panelists uh, for this very dynamic conversation uh, that we've been having on these issues. It's been a very big topic. Um, and of course, there are still many things that we can continue to discuss and we will continue discussing. Uh, this has been the second session um, of the dialogue on these issues, but we will continue in other forms. Um, and we encourage all participants to uh, check the events pages on Citizens for Global Solutions and World Federalist Movement websites for other upcoming events where we will be continuing dialogue in various different ways. Um, thank you also to uh, Rebecca, my co-chair, for helping to facilitate the conversation uh, between our panellists and also to bring in some of the questions. Uh, we apologise that due to the shortage of time, we weren't able to address all the questions, but we have taken note of these and these will be guiding us also in future events. Uh, this event is being recorded um, and once the recording is um, processed, we will then be able to make the link to that recording available uh, to all participants uh, so that if you want to like revisit some of what has been said, uh, you'll be able to do that with the recording. Uh, and I think with that, I come to thank uh, the co-sponsors again, which is Citizens for Global Solutions, Parliamentarians for Nuclear Nonproliferation and Disarmament, a World, Future, World Federalist Movement, Institute for Global Policy, and Parliamentarians for Nuclear Nonproliferation and Disarmament, and also some of the people behind the scenes who have make, made sure that this has been working. Thank you very much, everybody, for your participation. We hope that you keep the hope parts of this alive. There, we know that there are very difficult situations that we're dealing with, um, but we want to, we're coming forward showing that it is possible to move to a, a, a zero carbon uh, economies. It is possible to move to the security of a world without nuclear weapons. It is possible to build a secure, a confidence that we can have security without relying not only on nuclear weapons but the threat or use of force and implement the UN Charter uh, obligations for uh, uh, resolving conflicts peacefully and ensuring that the world is one of peace and sustainability for current and future generations. Thank you very much. Have a good day, afternoon, evening, morning, wherever you are, and we look forward to seeing you again in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.